having a series of studies, we're starting off tonight in the epistle of James. We've been having a series of studies on the names of God. Well, ne next week there's no Bible study, it's our missionary news night. Then a couple of weeks after that I'll be off for a weekend and holiday. So rather than start a new series, we're going to spend a further week or two considering God. It seems almost a bit presumptuous to put it like that, but you know what I mean. To think about God. You know that marvelous passage at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 40? Comfort ye my people, saith your God. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Now that really means consider carefully the kind of God that you have. And what we've been trying to do in, in studying the names of God, particularly in the Old Testament, is this. We've been considering the person of God. We've been considering the nature of God. We've been considering the changelessness of God. And we've been speaking in measure at least about the integrity of God. I don't know how many of you have Jim Packer's book, Knowing God, but if you don't have it, you should have it. It's one of these books that you should keep within reach and pick it up, an excellent index at the back, and all the different chapters about God. It's our most, it's our most creative and constructive and heartwarming book, as well as a very accurate theological book. And his whole concern is that we should learn to know God. And where we really start tonight is this thought last mentioned of the integrity of God. Now what do we mean by the integrity of God? Well what I mean tonight is that he is a God who can be counted on. Now we all know, we all know what it means to us if we've got friends that we feel we can count on. You know, they're always there. They're always the same. They're always ready. They're always willing. They're always right at hand. They, they never have qualifications about their desire to meet us at our point of need. Well, God is like that. He is a God who can be counted on. And he is a God with whom there is no change at all. Look at it in the epistle of James chapter 1, first of all at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Oh, one, one of the great things about getting to heaven is that we won't any more ever, to any degree at all, be tempted to evil. Well, God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That is, he, God tempts no one in the direction. Yes, God tests us. Yes, God puts us through trials. But God never tempts God, God will never, to even the slightest degree, incline us towards what is wrong. And any time that we feel tempted with that temptation that arises within ourselves, it is God who holds on to us and says, You are not going there. You know how sometimes you're driving your car, for example, you'll see a, a, a youngster, a, a very young child, you know, w wanting the sense to cross the road. And a parent grabs hold and holds on. You see, it would be dangerous. Therefore, the parent holds. Oh, the child can scream blue, blue murder if it likes. But the parent will not let it go because it's dangerous. Now, that's the kind of God we have. And I, for one, am very relieved that we've got a God like that. 
Because when we're being honest, we would, all, we would all confess that we have got a colossal capacity for getting things wrong. But God is the consistent one. He says, no, you're not going there. Look down to verse 17. Every good endowment or every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. It's a lovely phrase that describing God, isn't it? The Father of lights. There's, there's nothing shadowy or uncertain. You know, people sometimes, if this arises in pastoral life, Christian people sometimes talk about God as, as if God was perversely trying to make things as difficult as possible. You know, God, God setting himself to, to withhold guidance. That's not what God is like. He's, he's terribly open, is God. And he said, he's, he's tremendously innocent, is God. Completely open. Every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Isn't that absolutely marvelous? And that's the kind of God we have. No variation. You can count on him, you see. And no shadow due to change. And when you think of it all through the Bible, it is this God who is dealing with his people and dealing with his work. And all through the Bible we read the stories of men dealing with God and men being dealt with by God. God's always there. And we need to turn back now to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 at verse 28. Dealing with God and God dealing with us. And we know that in everything God works for good. Now everything is a very comprehensive word. It includes all our blunders and all our stupidities in everything. Yes, God says, you've made an awful botch of things again. But in everything, including that, God works for good with those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? And I think it's terribly important in all the business of our dealing with God and God dealing with us to keep very, very clearly in our minds that God is for us. He's not against us. It's amazing how often in our confused thinking and our even more confused feeling, we begin almost to, to, to think and to feel that God is against us. He's not. Well, you see, we can be absolutely sure of that. God would say, well, if I'm in any sense against you, would I have sent my son, my only son, my well-beloved son, to the death of the cross 
Would, would I have done that if I was in any sense against you? God is for us, not against us. And you begin to see, hopefully, at least I'm beginning to see it more clearly than ever now, how important it is to consider God. And not only to consider God, but to be aware of God. You know, there is the book that's entitled The Practice of the Presence of God. And some people, some people sort of distort that and make it into almost a, a kind of a psychological conditioning so that you will feel God. That's, that's not the way. The practice of the presence of God is to say to ourselves over and over again what Sinclair Ferguson was saying the other Sunday evening. God says, I will be with you. Now, do we believe it? And if we believe it, are we prepared to reckon on it? The practice of the presence of God. And this is something that's very important, you see, because we will then be... How can I put it? We will reach the stage... In which, at which no matter what is happening to us, we will instinctively count on God. Now, I think that's very important. Because, you see, one of the great things of the devil, of the devil's technique, is to get us to forget God. To get us to feel, you're on your own, chum. But, you see, we're not. And we need to consider God in all the different aspects of his person and his nature and his activity so that we will become aware of God. Do you ever, do you ever find yourself in a situation where, where you could almost say it out loud? God's with me. It's a great feeling. It really is. And in this way, we begin instinctively to count on God. And more and more we will recognize, as we look back over life, that we have, in fact, been in God's good hand. And I feel that this is something in the hustle and bustle of our Christian life and activity, we do far too seldom. It's quite a while since we sang in church that hymn that begins, When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love and play. And then goes, when in the slippery paths of youth, I, I find... If that's right, I'm growing old. I find that I look back to these early days and marvel that all the things that could so easily have happened didn't happen because God's good hand was there bringing me and bringing you safely through. I was thinking already of what I'm going to be saying to the children next Sunday at the Sunday School Prize Giving. I think I may say to them that, although they don't know about this, that way back in 1955, this church was nearly closed. And on a, on a strict presbytery level, all the evidence confirmed that it should have been closed. But you see, God's hand kept it open. I'm quite glad. I think you are as well. But you see, this, this considering of God, and I'm taking too long to say all this, I'm sorry. This considering of God is something that is of tremendous importance, 
both for our own personal lives as Christians and for the work to which God has called us. Because the work is his and we are his. And his is the good hand that is upon us. And God is always sovereign in initiative. He acts first. He always commits himself first. This everlasting and unchanging God. So let's look back now to the Old Testament and go right back to the book of Genesis. I think we referred to some of these references on a previous occasion, but repetition doesn't do any harm. We're thinking of the, the everlasting and the unchanging God. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Look down to verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and... Notice, God first. We rebuke our children who say, me and my chum. No, 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 your chum first. But when it's God, it's God first. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Oh, what a word that is to parents. God says, I'll... I'll be your God and I'll be your children's God after you. I give you my word, says God, and to your children's children, I give you my word, says God. And when God gives his word, he never goes back on it. Never, never, never. Look down to verse 19. Abraham saying in verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael might live in thy sight. But God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. You see, the everlasting covenant of the everlasting God. And this is the God who says to his people again and again, right through the Old Testament, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I acted. I committed myself to you. I worked on your behalf. Disgruntled, disaffected, demoralized people that you were, I made you my people. I... I paid the price and I redeemed you and I've committed myself to you. And God doesn't go in for broken engagements. He gives his word and he keeps it. Turn over to Genesis chapter 21. At verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. I, I understand, although I'm not quite sure about this, that when we have our trip to Israel later on, we're going to visit Beersheba. And I would like to be there and to think of how in that very place Abraham called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now turn over quickly to Deuteronomy. <coughs> you should all know the next verse that's coming. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27. The eternal God is your dwelling place. 
the old version has it, the eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And I haven't heard of anybody who can fall through the everlasting arms. This is the kind of God we have. Turn over now to the second book of Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 23. And if you think we're going quickly now, I'm just trying to beat the clock. Second Samuel chapter 23 at verse 5. Breaking into the words of, of David. Second Samuel 23 verse 5. Yea, does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. Oh, I, li I like the emphasis on the all things. There's nothing missed out. There's nothing forgotten. So easy to forget. I've got a bit of paper in my desk that has, on, has it on, the, on it the words uh, BBC tape to D. Johnson. I haven't a clue who D. Johnson is. It's in my writing. There's no letter from him. He doesn't get the congregational. So if anybody knows a D. Johnson who wants a, a tape of the broadcast, I've please tell me. I've completely forgotten. That's something you see that wasn't secure. But he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all. Oh, it's, it's great. Every little bit is settled and supervised. That's what this verse is saying. Ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? What's that phrase in the hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty? Hast thou not seen how thy heart's wishes have been granted in what? ordain turn over now to the book of Psalms Psalm number 90 Lord thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting thou art Wasn't it great having our minds stretched and our hearts warmed as Sinclair Ferguson spoke of the eternity of God the other Sunday evening, the self-existent one from everlasting to everlasting. And there's no break all the way through. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm number 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. Yea, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Thy throne is established from old. Thou art from everlasting. The everlasting God, the everlasting throne, Turn over to Psalm 102. And this is only a very, very short selection of psalms that speak about this theme. And the Psalter, of course, is the worship book of the Old Testament. And you begin to see how, why some of these Old Testament men and women were such mighty characters. You see, they dealt with God. They considered their God. Psalm 102, look down to verse 24. O my God, I say, take me not hence in the midst of my days, thou whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old thou didst lay the foundation of the earth, 
and the heavens are the work of thy hands, they will perish. The whole of creation has a limited span. They will perish, but thou dost endure. They will wear out like a garment. Thou changest them like raiment and they pass away, but thou art the same. And thy years have no end. Psalm 145. At verse 13. Little wonder the psalm begins, I'll thee extol my God, O King, I'll bless thy name always. Look down to verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words, and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds, that is, the Lord holds up those who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. You see how, how the psalmist's thoughts of God are at the very heart of his worship. This thought of the everlasting unchangeable always to be depended on God turn over to Isaiah we hardly need to look up this verse Isaiah chapter 9 at verse 6 unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God Everlasting Father. Everlastingly the Father of his children. And oh, what a Father. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 26. You'll see that I've been using my concordance a lot this week. Isaiah chapter 26 at verse 3. Thou dost keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on... No, whose mind? That is thinking about God. That's, that's the essence of peace. If you think about yourself, you won't be at peace. If you think about your situation, you won't be at peace. If you think of the world round about you, you won't be at peace. If you think about the devil, you won't be at peace. Do you think about God? Thou dost keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Turn over to Isaiah 35. <clears throat> Verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Turn over to Isaiah 54. I hope you knew that all these lovely verses were in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 54 at verse 8. Or read in from verse 7. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath for a moment I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love I will have compassion on you. I suppose there are earthly parents 
who've known what it is to have their offspring break their hearts. But they still love their child. Well, if, if, if a mere mortal can be like that, how much more God, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. T turn back briefly to Isaiah chapter 40. At verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Look down to verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, because their God is the everlasting God. God. Oh, there were other references we haven't time. Isaiah 57 verse 15 speaks of God as the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. A tremendous verse. But there's the other bit of the verse. The high and lofty one who inhabits eternity and who dwells with the lowly and contrite in heart. Him up there takes delight in coming down to the likes of you and me. There's a verse I can't quote it accurately, so I'll need to look it up in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Oh yes, I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. If, if anybody else had been your God, he would have cast you aside by now. But I, the Lord, do not change. I gave my word of promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to Joseph, and down through the generations. I, I, the everlasting God, have pledged myself to my people. And I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. The unchanging God, the independent God, he needs no one, the self-sufficient God, the God of whom it is said in the beginning, God, and all along the line, he works his sovereign will, never deflected from his purposes, never changing in regard, of his, regard to his people, Remember the other week I told you I'd been at a, at a Christian union, was it in St. Andrews, speaking in the word from Hosea, eh, how can I give you up? Remember how the context of that in, in Hosea, my people are determined to backslide. And after a pause, God says, how can I give you up? And God, being essentially simple, says, I can't do it. I can't. You're mine. I pledged myself to you in an everlasting covenant. I cannot give you up. I've got one last reference here can't remember what it is. Psalm number 33. And here we finish and get on to prayer. Psalm number 33 at verse 10. Ah, yes. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord 
stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. <coughs> God says, What I felt in my heart for you when I chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, that I have felt for you all along the line. That's what I feel about you now, and that is what I'll feel about you for all the days to come. And that is God, the everlasting God. Amen, and may God bless to us his own good word.